This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. It's a, a great joy to welcome you to this very special UC San Diego 50th anniversary Helen Edison lecture with Professor Amartya Sen. I am Fauna Foreman Barzilai, Associate Professor of Political Science and co-director of the new UCSD Center on Global Justice. Before proceeding any further tonight, um, it's my honor to introduce UCSD Chancellor Marianne Fox to say a few words of welcome. Marianne Fox is a renowned chemist um, who recently received the National Medal of Science from President Barack Obama, the highest honor bestowed by the United States government on scientists, engineers, and inventors. She was named the seventh chancellor of UCSD in 2004, the first woman to serve the university as permanent chancellor. And under her leadership, we have strengthened our status as one of the top higher education and research universities in the nation. We recently surpassed $1 billion in research funding for the first time in the university's 50-year history. We initiated more than $1.6 billion in building projects and added 2.2 million assignable square feet of space on campus. This has benefited both the university and the community by providing new facilities on campus and creating jobs for people in San Diego. Chancellor Fox has been a great supporter of our new global justice initiative here on campus. And it is a great honor to welcome her here tonight. Chancellor Fox. Thank you, Fauna, and thank you for the great leadership that led to this new center. Welcome to all of you to the Helen Edison Lecture, which is a very special event for many reasons. First, tonight's keynote speaker is one of the world's leading social thinkers and a Nobel Prize winner. So we're very excited to welcome Professor Amartya Sen and look forward to your talk. Sen's lecture on local and global justice also kicks off the new and special three-day conference called New Frontiers in Global Justice. And I welcome our conference participants and the participants in the Clinton Global Initiative University event, which begins tomorrow. Another reason this event is so special is it's taking place during UC San Diego's 50th anniversary and the year-long celebration. Our founders established a tradition of excellence which has been imitated but never com completely paralyzed, developed in parallel. Indeed, we've recruited the top world scholars and students to this campus over the last five decades, and they've become known for their strengths intellectually as they've grown to, us, to look at environmental sustainability, political and economic development, immigration studies, and global health. Our campus community has also become known for an environment of collaboration. Indeed, I think the, the close interaction between people of different departments, what be they students, staff, or faculty, characterizes the kinds of things that will go on in the new Center for Global Justice. It will provide support and, structures and a structure for our social science researchers who are working on numerous diverse global initiatives so that they can more easily exchange ideas, that they can work across disciplines, that they can convert their theories into meaningful action as Professor Sen has done so brilliantly. In fact, our social science research is quite broad, but it shares a very important goal, to improve human life and well-being. So with this new center, and enhanced collaboration that will be facilitated, we hope to increase our impact and help even more people. And that is pretty special, just like this evening. So thank you for joining us for this lecture. Thank you for celebration of our new conference and center on global justice. 
and enjoy the presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Fox, for being here tonight. Our sincere thanks as well to Senior Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Suresh Subramani, and Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Penny Rue, who are both here tonight as well. Now, a few years ago, UC San Diego adopted a new tagline, and it reads like this, local impact, national influence, global reach. And I'm struck continually just how committed we are as a campus community to this vision. I wish I could thank each and every campus administrator, dean, provost, department chair, and institute director across this great campus who has generously supported this project. Please have a look at the impressive, uh, the impressive list of our campus sponsors printed on tonight's program. And I wish I could thank every member of the San Diego community by name, every colleague and every student, graduate student, un undergraduate, who has inspired us and come forward with exciting ideas and offers of assistance. But we'd, we would be here a very, very long time. And now to our speaker. Amartya Sen is Thomas W. Lamont University professor and professor of economics and philosophy at Harvard University, and a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, where he also served as master from 1998 to 2004. Amartya Sen received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998 for his contributions to welfare economics, for essentially figuring out why and how famines happen and how relatively easy it is, it turns out, to prevent them. He's devoted his long and distinguished career to an astounding range of subjects in economics and philosophy, including social choice theory, welfare economics, development economics, public health, gender studies, moral and political philosophy, and the economics of peace and war. And tonight, he will speak to us on the theme of justice, local and global, debunking an unfortunate myth, I fully suspect, that these goals are incompatible or that focusing on one necessitates a neglect of the other. Now, the swell of excitement for this talk, which is palpable here tonight, is a real testament to the interest that Amartya Sen's work continues to generate across generations, across disciplines, on campus, and off. My undergraduates were as fired up about tonight as my colleagues whose friendships with Amartya Sen go back 40 years, and in some cases even, even further back. The Undergraduate International Relations Journal Prospect established a Facebook page here on campus for the event, and within a week or two, 700 undergraduates had RSVP'd for this event. I'm so grateful to them. I'm so grateful to the undergraduates for coming out tonight. Thank you. And it was equally exciting for us to discover so much enthusiasm in the local community, particularly among practitioners who work every day to reduce the very sorts of injustices and deprivations that Amartya Sen has devoted his life's work to illuminating and tackling. He's one of those rare intellectuals whose work has impacted both academic and practical life, pushing the boundaries of academic discourse in profound and often paradigm-shattering ways while bettering the condition of human life on the ground. His work on famine has saved untold millions of lives. His cultivation of the capabilities approach to development assessment has very literally changed the way we all now think about global development goals. I cannot imagine an individual whose work better exemplifies the impact that the social sciences can have in the realm of global justice, the relation between theory and practice. And it's an honor and a privilege that he's here this evening to help us launch our new center. I should say, too, that we're joined this evening by another very special guest. It's an honor to welcome Professor Eleanor Ostrom, to UC San Diego. 
She is Distinguished Professor and Arthur F. Bentley Professor of Political Science at Indiana University and recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics last year in 2009 for her work on common pool resource management. Again, a brilliant example of social science research in action, bettering human life on the ground. Welcome, Professor Ostrom. We're delighted that you're here with us. Well, what remains now is to please give an extremely warm welcome to Professor Amartya Sen. Chancellor, another friend, it's a great privilege for me to be here. I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity and also very enthused by the fact that there's so many people who are ready to discuss these issues. And I really feel very deeply honored and uh, extremely gratified, if I may <laughs> use that expression. Um, I'll begin, I will read my talk so from time to time. I may have to depart from it um, for an incident, one remark or another. But it begins with a remark of Dr. Martin Luther King. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, said Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That was nearly 50 years ago in 19... April 1963, in a letter from Birmingham jail. King was then deeply involved in battling injustice from which African Americans in the United States suffered. He was jailed for his political activities for this local cause, and he would soon lose his life in the hand of someone opposed to his political belief for America. And yet King's attention was not confined only to issues of local or American injustice. As a visionary leader, King looked at huge injustices across the globe, and he was committed to helping people everywhere in the world to remove these injustices. The passage from the local to the global was not a difficult one in King's understanding of the demands of justice, and he clearly attempted to see his involvement with injustice in America as a part of his general interest in global justice across the world. The connection between injustices across the world are particularly worth remembering here in this meeting at the UCST, when the university, in celebrating the 50th anniversary of its founding, establishes a new center for global justice. There are, of course, many complex issues to be addressed in discussing the connections between injustices at home and those abroad, and also in assessing how our commitment to counter them both should determine the balance of our efforts and responsibilities. These questions will no doubt receive attention in the work of the new Center for Global Justice, dedicated as it is to, I understand, uh, social science research in action. But underlying those variety of issues that demand critical examination lies one very big understanding to which Martin Luther King gave such eloquent expression. We cannot limit our commitment to fighting injustice only at home while regarding injustice abroad to be none of our business. Let me discuss briefly here a point that a great philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, tried to make, a point that is, I believe, mistaken, which is nevertheless important to consider. Nietzsche argued in one of his particularly contrary moments, I quote, the Christian resolve to find the world ugly and bad has made the world ugly and bad, unquote. With some effort, I think I can understand what Nietzsche could have meant. 
But it is hard for me, and I emphasize it's hard for me as a completely non-religious person as I am, to be at all persuaded that Nietzsche was correct in his attribution. The diagnosis of nastiness in the world as being the result of what we expect seems very implausible since there are so many objective ways in which the world can be seen to be full of injustices and miseries. The nastiness in the world that Martin Luther King, or Mother Teresa, or Desmond Tutu, or Mahatma Gandhi, or Nelson Mandela saw and fought against were decidedly not their creation. The real problem in the survival and resilience of terrible things happening in the world may come, I would argue, from exactly the opposite direction, opposite to the one that Nietzsche was pointing. It can be argued that the common tendency not to recognize, to ignore, how terribly unjust the world is, helps serious injustices to remain unaddressed and unremedied. The absence of critical examination and scrutiny, along with silence and inaction, contributes to the continuation of remediable injustices that plague humanity. There are, of course, critical questions to be addressed in taking a global view of injustice, but the basic issue is simple enough. To address a problem, we have first to recognize it. But how do we recognize injustice? The difficult conceptual issue that has to be addressed is the determination of how justice and injustice in the world has to be examined and scrutinized. How do we, how do we rebut or put forward our claims? This is where we need political philosophy in general and a theory of justice in particular. And that leads to the next question, what kind of a theory should a theory of justice be? What do we need from a theory of justice? I've tried to address these issues in a recent book called The Idea of Justice. Mainstream theories of justice in contemporary political philosophy differ from each other in many respects. But they have a general approach in common, these are the mainstream theories, the approach of so-called social contract theory. The social contract approach was pioneered by Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century. It has been the strongest influence in the analysis of justice from the 18th century to our own time. It was developed more fully in the 18th century, as I will discuss. The distinguishing features of the approach included taking the characterization of quote unquote just institutions to be the principal and often, often the only identified task of the theory of justice. This way of seeing justice is woven in different ways around the idea of an imagined social contract a hypothetical contract about social organization that the people of a sovereign state, all the people, could be imagined to have endorsed and accepted in an impartial way, not worrying about their own vested interests. Armed with that diagnosis of a just set of social institutions, the approach proceeds to identify transgressions from that ideal as clear cases of injustice. Major contributions were made in the contractarian line of thinking by Thomas Hobbes, as I mentioned already, and later, among others, by John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant, although Kant presented many other lines of reasoning as well. The contractarian approach has remained the dominant influence in contemporary political philosophy, led by the most prominent, and I believe the greatest political philosopher of our time, John Rawls, whose classic book, A Theory of Justice, published in 1971, presents a far-reaching statement um, 
uh, of a particular version of the social contract approach to justice, which I should be disputing, but I should say that my own engagement in theory of justice was derived um, to a great extent from John Rawls's, um, um, what I've learned from his reading, from having him as a friend, from having taught courses together, um, and um, from generally from his, and also from his comments and critiques. Uh, my book, by the way, even though in disagreement with Rawls, is dedicated to John Rawls, I should mention that. <laughs> the principal theories of justice in contemporary political philosophy, coming not only from Rawls, but also from Robert Nozick, Ronald Dworkin, David Gauthier, and others, though different from each other in terms of the diagnosis of exactly what the just institutional social contract demands, share in common the idea of a social contract that identifies ideal social institutions, and that being at the center of the territory of a theory of justice. Dworkin's ideal social institutions, which include his advocacy for equality of resources, are not the same as those of Rawls, nor are the Rawlsian Rawlsian ideal institution, the same as those of Nozick's libertarian just world. But these theories of justice have all tended to see the primary idea of justice as being about identifying a particular set of principles, principles of justice, that in turn fix the ideal social institution. Even as they differ from each other, on what these ideal social institutions should be. Since these institutions have to be implemented, they all need a sovereign state to oversee a respectively identified social contract. And that does, of course, imply that there can hardly be any general idea of quote unquote global justice, since the very idea of justice in the social contract approach is dependent on, indeed one could even say parasitic on, the domain of a sovereign state. For global justice, we need in this approach a global sovereign state. There is clearly no such thing right now, nor is there going to be one that would pop up in the near future. Indeed, as one of the leading and one of the greatest contemporary political philosophers, Thomas Nagel, has argued in a very engaging article uh, on global justice published in Philosophy and Public Affairs in 2005. I quote from Nagel, it seems to me very difficult to resist Hobbes' claim about the relation between justice and sovereignty. And if Hobbes is right, the idea of global justice without a world government is a chimera, unquote. Is this nihilism about the possibility of cogent thinking about global justice right? I would presently, I will presently argue against it. But before I proceed with that argument, let me first talk about a different line of reasoning about justice that was also present in the European Enlightenment and that was pursued in various ways by a number of political philosophers at that time. These theorists did not erect a fully developed structure of a theory of justice. That they didn't see that as their primary exercise anyway. But they worked mainly by implication on the ingredient of a different approach, different from the social contract approach. Seen in a theoretical perspective, there is a theory of justice that can be developed from the alternative from this alternative understanding of the demands of justice. These theorists include, among others, Adam Smith, the Marco de Condorcet, and Mary Wollstonecraft, to mention a few in the 18th century, um, who took a variety of approaches that differed in many ways from each other, 
but who shared a common interest in reducing identifiable injustices in the world around them, rather than trying to characterize a world of perfect justice. They were involved in making comparisons between different ways in pe which people's lives may go, jointly influenced by the working of institutions, very important, but not just institutions, also people's actual behavior, their social interaction, and other factors that significantly impact on what actually happens. Indeed, I know of no better work than Mary Wilsoncraft's second book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, where she discusses why for that vindication, and one of the first, earliest books on uh, feminist thinking, as to why for that you not only need particular types of institutions, but many other things, behavior patterns, public discussions, the nature of public dialogue. Uh, I, I personally think Mary Wilson Cuffs is probably the most um, important of the neglected philosophical thinkers, and I emphasize the word philosophical here, uh, because professional philosophers took no interest in her, mainly remembered her as, as William Godwin's wife and Mary Shelley's mother, Frankenstein's mother, but not as, as a great philosopher as she was. In my book, The Idea of Justice, I've tried to develop an alternative theory of justice, a different way of seeing justice and injustice in the world, by drawing on and extending the second tradition, which also originated in the period of European Enlightenment, but which differed radically from the social contract approach. By the way, the, one of the aspects I want to make is that I'm talking about the connection with the European Enlightenment here. Um, and with one exception to which I'll come later, I don't go beyond the European thought here. But the book discusses also how the ancestry of many of these ideas go well beyond the European limits. In fact, at the time when the interaction of ideas between Europe, the Middle East, India, China, Japan, Korea, uh, at different levels, were part of the global engagement that made the contemporary world, and indeed, I would argue, even the European Enlightenment possible. The analytical and rather mathematical discipline of social choice theory, which had its origin in the works of French mathematicians in the 18th century, in particular Condorcet, the Marquis de Condorcet to whom I referred earlier, but others also like Bolda, and which had been revived and reformulated in our own time by Kenneth Arrow, belonged robustly to the second line of investigation. Even though the connection is not often seen because one is a very mathematical discipline and the other is not. Mary Wilson Crawford didn't present any idea mathematically, but there is a clear connection. I must confess that I've been very involved in the development and use of social choice theory and have, have been, as have been a number of other economic and political theorists right here in San Diego. This is, of course, for me, a big link with UCSD. And I might mention that link runs through almost the entire history of the 50 years of um, UCSD because my connection which was established in the 60s, have been very strong, including communication as well as visiting, and I treasure this contact very much. I argue in the book, Idea of Justice, that a more satisfactory theory of justice that is more satisfactory than the social contract approach, pioneered by Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and to some extent Kant, and pursued in contemporary political philosophy by John Rawls, Robert Nozick, Ronald Dworkin, and others, more satisfactory theory than that, can draw on the social choice approach in the broad sense. This pursuit in the broad sense requires us to use both the mathematical understanding of the nature of relational orders, choice functions, and the nature of aggregate assessments, aggregation in general, and a more general 
and largely non-mathematical reasoning about political and moral judgments and societal decisions and, of course, moral and political philosophy. And I should mention I've been privileged also to have contact with the philosophers here in addition to economists for a very long time. There are three principal departures from the social contract approach in the theory of justice I'm trying to present. They relate respectively to one, its comparative nature, that is of the theory that I'm trying to present. It focuses on the lives of people rather than merely on institutions. And three, its inclusiveness in allowing voices from distance, not confining attention only to the views of the citizens of a given sovereign country. These three aspects of the theory presented are analytically distinct issues, but they complement each other, I believe, very well. First, rather than beginning by asking what is perfect justice, a question and answer in which there could be substantial differences even among very reasonable people, and even after a good deal of reasoned arguments, I argue for following Condorcet and Smith and Wollstonecraft in asking about the identification of clear cases of injustice on which agreement could emerge on the basis of reasoning. That may not be enough for identifying an ideally just social state or even ideal social institution. Typically, there won't be. But it could be enough for a social agreement on many cases of injustice and on the urgent need for removing them. To illustrate, in arguing, for example, for the abolition of slavery, as both Marquis de Condorcet and Adam Smith did, and so did Mary Wilsoncraft, they did not have to seek an agreement on the nature of the perfectly just society. Recognition of the injustice of slavery can coexist with many different diagnoses of an ideal society. Second, our focus need not be only on institutions, in contrast with the social contract approach, which is interested primarily on the identification of quote-unquote just institutions. We can examine instead the nature of the lives that people are actually able to lead, including their welfare and their freedom, including capability, which was mentioned earlier, including, of course, the different ways in which these institu uh, the institutions influence people's lives. Institutions too, but just not just that. Third, unlike the social contract approach, which by construction must be confined to the people of a particular sovereign state, the alternative approach can involve people from anywhere in the world. Since the focus is on reasoning, and in po when possible on reasoned agreement, rather than on a state-based social contract to be implemented by a sovereign state. The departure makes reasoning on global justice possible, which is essential for addressing such problems as global economic crisis or global warming or prevention and management of global pandemics, such as the AIDS epidemic. Global justice then can be seen as the pursuit of widespread agreement after open public reasoning on cases of unfairness and injustice to which we can pay reasoned attention. This is not a chimera, but an invitation to engagement in public reasoning, including global public reasoning. The new Center for Global Justice that is being inaugurated here can be seen, I would argue, as a well-conceived response to this invitation. There are obvious practical advantages of an approach of this kind, in that it allows articulation and, when feasible, agreement on what should be done here and now. But I want to emphasize that the points of difference do not rest only on consideration of practical advantage but they are based on the soundness of the theory that underlies practical reasoning. Indeed, each of the departures relate to answer answering the question, what kind of a theory of justice do we need as a theory of practical reason? 
consider the first departure, focusing on comparatives rather than on superlatives, or the transcendental, as some people don't like the comparative perspective, even to the extent of distinguishing, and, uh, and understandably, between the best and the right. But transcendental covers both. Something that cannot be transcended. If it is just right, then there's nothing better. And if it's best, then there's nothing better. That's the point in common, and that's the one I want to need, want need here. The point is not just that in any actual choice, we tend to be confined to non-transcendental alternatives. That simply is the case. The important issues involve, and these are theoretical issues, both the non-necessity as well as the non-sufficiency of beginning with the di diagnosis of an ideal. There is, in fact, a basic mathematical issue here. An agreement on what the top is need not tell us much about the nature of different orderings that have the same top. Even if two persons agree that of the three distinct alternatives, one option, let's call it A, is the ideal, and clearly the best of the three options, A, B, and C, they still would not tell us that they agree on the ranking of non-ideal alternatives, B and C. If one person puts A above B, and that above C, and the other places A above C, and that above B, they do agree on the ideal to it A. That's a transcendental alternative in this case, since they rank, but they, they, it, they don't tell us anything about B and C because they rank B and C in exactly the opposite way. And therefore, the diagnosis of the ideal does not tell us anything at all about what would be better to choose if you had to face the choice over B and C. So the whole pro project of having an identified ideal uh, uh, set of institutions given by the principles of justice, and that's somehow not supposed to determine only the transcendental alternative, but also all the choices that may, we might actually face in taking practical decisions, I would argue is analytically deeply flawed. flawed. If non-sufficiency is an important limitation of the theoretical strategy of proceeding from the ideal, non-necessity is another. If we agree that A is clearly less unjust than B, and from that sense better than B, we may have no great problem in choosing between them, namely A over B. And yet we may not be sure what the ideal situation is of or whether A itself is an idea, is the ideal, or perhaps some other alternative, B and C, which are not being considered now because they're not on the menu. We do not have to compare other alternatives in the language of social choice theory, irrelevant alternatives to A and B to sensibly choose between A and B. The non-necessity of agreeing on the ideal is a huge relief for a grounded theory of comparative assessment, since we can, in fact, agree on many comparisons without being able to agree on all comparisons and without being able to identify the ideal alternative. We may disagree on the exact importance to be attached to consideration of celibacy over those of economic equity. Both are very attractive ideas. They certainly attract, both of them attract me greatly. And I spent some time in social choice theory in the conflict that such rival attractions may generate. But we can still agree that people dying of illnesses for which remedies are known and remedies that can be cheaply produced and delivered is clearly unjust. Similarly, we can agree, after open public reasoning, that prosecuting raped women for adultery is a gross violation of the demands of justice, as are other cases, including some that have been studied by members of the UCSD faculty connected with different, from foot binding in China to genital mutilation in Africa. There are issues on which agreement may emerge and may be adequate for policy change, and they do not pre-require what the ideal situation in the world is or could be. 
I make a theoretical clarification now, because I know this is a very mixed audience, because I'm now addressing primarily theorists. I should perhaps use this occasion to correct the misunderstanding of my claim that I have seen often articulated and pursued. What better occasion than to get so many people to get it across? <laughs> In arguing against relying on the identification of a perfectly just option, an ideal alternative, I'm not arguing against uh, what in professional philosophy is called an ideal theory over some kind of operational wisdom. Rather, I'm concerned with the subject matter of a theory of justice, what it should be, and this applies as much to ideal theories as it does to very practical um, reasoning. The distinction between ideal theory which clears our ideas and a practical rule to follow is an important one and is often critically important to consider for being able to use the clarity of ideas in simple cases to enlighten, enlighten the underlying issues behind actual decisions, which are not rules of thumb. This issue is a separate one altogether from that involved in the discourse over whether our theory, even ideal theory, should be com concerned with comparisons of the alternatives involved in a choice or with the identification of the transcendental best or the right. An ideal theory need not be concerned only with or even at all with ideal alternatives. It's important that an alternative theory of justice, based on a different diagnosis of what a theory of justice demands, is not confused as a practical shortcut that dispenses with the need for sophisticated theory. Practical reasoning has its own discipline, and it's important to get that right. What about the second departure? changing the focus of attention from institutions to what I call social realizations, how people's lives are going, including any um, important way in which institutions come into it, not just the narrowly defined consequences, but broad. In understanding the contrast between an arrangement focus and a, or institution focus and a realization focused view of justice, it's useful to invoke an old distinction from the Sanskrit literature on ethics and jurisprudence. Consider two different words, niti and naya, both of which stand for justice in classical Sanskrit. Sanskrit has more than 20 different words for justice, but niti and naya are the two most commonly used. But they have rather different sense. Among the principal users of the term niti, are organizational propriety and behavioral correctness. In contrast with niti, the term naya stands for a comprehensive concept of realized justice. It deals with social realizations. In that line of vision, that of naya, the role of institutions, rules, organizations, important as they are, have to be assessed in the broader and more inclusive perspective of Naya, which is inescapably linked with the world that actually emerges, not just the institutions and rules we happen to have. To actually, I, I don't discuss it, uh, in, I'm going away from the paper, but uh, I do I discuss in the book that one of the great documents in India, namely the Gita, is really a long dialogue between Krishna taking a niti perspective is right that you should have uh, the appropriate uh, performance of duty no matter what happens. And Arjun saying, why should I, he's the invincible hero, but he's not worried that he may be killed, he's worried that he may kill others. And he said, how could you say that I should do that irrespective of what happens? It's surely a matter of concern for me if so many people die and indeed I kill them. So that's a kind of debate between Niti and Naya that has gone on for literally thousands of years. To consider a particular application, early Indian legal theorists talked disparagingly of what they call Matsya Naya. Matsya is fish. Naya is what I described, justice. 
So it's justice in the world of fish. And this justice, the Sanskrit theorists had determined in the world of fish is that a big fish can freely devour a small fish. And that just is enough for the fish. We are warned that avoiding matsanaya must be an essential part of justice. And it is crucial to make sure that the justice of fish is not allowed to invade the world of human beings. The term continues to be invoked, even though it was originally that distinction came in the um, about 600 before, years before Christ's birth. In 980, the lies, the last application I've seen, when the Palas, the Buddhist kings, established their rule over Bengal and Bihar, they said, now the Matsanaya will be removed and true justice will prevail. So it's a, it's a long, I mean, that's already a 15 year, more than 1500 year span. The central recognition here is that the realization of justice in the sense of Naya is not just a matter of judging institutions and rules, but of judging the societies themselves. No matter how proper the established organizations might be, if a big, big fish could still devour a small fish at will, then that must be a patent violation of human justice as Naya. Let me consider a European example to make the distinction between Nithi and Naya clearer. Ferdinand I, the Holy Roman Emperor, famously claimed in the 16th century, fiat justitia et periat mundus, which can be translated at, as, let justice be done, though the world perish, unquote. This severe maxim could figure as a niti, I have to say a very austere niti, that is advocated by some, indeed Emperor Ferdinand did just that. But it would be hard to accommodate a total catastrophe as an example of a just world when we understand justice in the broader sense of naya. If indeed the world does perish, there would be nothing much to celebrate in that accomplishment, even though the stern and severe niti leading to this extreme result could conceivably be defendable, as Ferdinand I tried, with very sophisticated argument of different kind, of a niti kind. It's important to appreciate that social realization is a more inclusive concept. It belongs to the territory of Naya, to which I'm partial. And it can include the importance of particular institutions when they're important, because they are part of what's happening in the world, in addition to the quality of the consequences they generate. Let me give an example. Even though death from hunger is itself terrible, people being forcibly starved to death is not the same thing from the point of view of justice as people dying from lack of food because of lack of income. Both cases are, of course, intolerable. And their removal may be a matter of justice in each case. But the injustice involved in death through forcible starvation has an element of horror that makes the bad situation even worse. So institutions, and policies, and actions are irreducibly significant. But their consequences on the lives of people are important as well. A primarily institutional theory, like that of Rawls or Dawkins or Nozick, may capture the former set of concerns, but can be insufficiently sensitive to the actual impact of institutions on people's lives, since they, that impact would depend also on other factors, such as the actual behavior pattern of the people involved. And I might say for the philosophers in the audience, in case, since there are a lot of people here, that to regard the social realization approach or the Naya approach as mere consequentialism in the way utilitarianism is, would be a profound mistake, because it's not that. A social realization approach, which involves some generalization and extension of traditional social choice theory, can do both. And recognize the fact, uh, and, and this does require the traditional uh, model of social choice to be extended, which I'm not going to discuss in which ways in this talk, uh, recognize the fact that our ideas of justice include both the narrowly defined consequences 
the state of affairs in the narrow sense, such as a person dying of starvation, and the way these consequences are brought about, the state of affairs in the broader intrusive sense, which includes whether the starving person died from the neglect of others or from deliberately homicidal acts of others in denying food to them. To conclude, the world in which we live is full of problems. We have not yet emerged from the global economic crisis that suddenly engulfed the world in 2008. We are in a state of worldwide insecurity related to sectarian violence and terrorism which find virulent expression from time to time, but which are almost continuously present in many different parts of the world. The problems of global epidemics continue, despite medical, major medical advances. The threats of global warming and environmental dangers have not been contained and removed. The sudden earthquake in Japan, with its far-reaching impact on human lives, has also brought out the vulnerability of our, some of our alleged ways and means of dealing with environmental crisis, for example, through the vulnerability of civil nuclear power, which would make the world rethink. And of course, the global de the danger of catastrophic disasters from nuclear bombs in the old and new arsenals in the world remain largely undiminished and since I'm a trustee of the Nuclear Threat Initiative set up by Ted Turner and, and uh, well, a, a number of uh, <laughs> senators involved, um, I'm not sure where to mention the active um, uh, senators as the only one, because the active senator in this case is, of course, Richard Luger. But the, um, the fact is that the Nuclear Threat Initiative's view uh, of the uh, of both of Sam Nunn, the former senator, as well as of um, uh, Ted Turner and, and Luger, is that despite all their achievements, the threat is to a great extent undiminished, and, and that, that danger hands, hangs over our head. The challenge we face today is not one of hankering after a perfectly just world, but of finding and agreeing on the means of restraining and, when possible, removing these adversities from which global humanity suffers. The approach I'm trying to present is ultimately one of theory. But it is a theory that is addressed to what I understand to be practical reason, to use the traditional language of moral and political philosophy. The global engagement that is needed to deal with the miseries and threats we face is one of public reasoning, including reasoning across national boundaries. I end with a few final remarks on the nature of global public discussion. First, the danger of making the, making the best the enemy of the good, or to be exact, making the perfect the enemy of the better, applied not only to the subject matter, to the subject matter of a theory of justice, but also to what kind of global engagement we need for reasoning across the national boundaries. It would be a huge mistake to assume that unless a global discussion includes everyone, it's bound to be worthless. The challenge is to broaden public discussion as much as possible, rather than insisting on perfect global discussion in an all or nothing framework. There are in fact elements of a global dialogue already in the world even though we may not always recognize its importance and relevance. Voices that can make a difference come from several routes, including global, global institutions as well as less formal communications and interchange, involving the media, the activities of NGOs, political agitation, social protests, as well as the formal routes of the United Nations and regional assemblies. These routes are not, of course, perfect for the purpose of global arguments, but they do exist and actually do offer, operate with some effectiveness. And they can be made more productive through supporting them, on the one hand, as well as, on the other, 
subjecting them to critical scrutiny through public reasoning. The plurality of avenues enhances the reach of global reasoning seen in this light. Second, it's important to recognize that a ranking of social alternatives need not be complete for it to be useful for practical reasoning. The basic relational framework of the mathematical kind has to be one of partial ordering, sometimes called quasi-ordering in this country in social choice theory, particularly pre-orderings in the French terminology rather than a complete ordering. The one I, in, I was very involved in social choice theory and remain uh, almost sleeping with Bourbaki's um, set theory and general topology. One of the distinctions that was absolutely clear that it, it's a huge mistake to bring with, begin with complete ordering, then you include exception in the form of incompleteness. And that's not the French mathematician, no. Going back all the way to Condorcet started. It's not an embarrassment for global reasoning that many questions remain unresolved, even as others are clearly, very clearly delineated. Third, the importance of global reasoning has to be distinguished from the expectation that people across the globe would very easily agree on the identification of injustice. It's not denied that habits of thought differ in different cultures, and as and they differ as often, I should emphasize, within one culture as well. It's not, not come as a surprise to Americans, or for that matter to Indians, that people within the same society often differ altogether radically from each other. And when I wrote my book, uh, previous book, Identity and Violence, I discussed why I thought it was completely a mistake to assume that Middle East has no interest in democratic participation. And I was told, and in fact, in the review, the primary review of it in Washington Post, said that I simply in a, lived in a non-real world. Uh, I have to say that the world has rather vindicating my belief that reasoning can run across frontiers very easily. But we have to recognize that that reasoning has work to do. There is neither any need to rely on pre-existing agreement, nor any necessity of assuming that all differences will be resolved by reasoning. They may not be. The discipline of justice through public reasoning includes these limitations, but they do not undermine in any way the discipline of public reasoning. Indeed, those characteristics are part and parcel of the discipline of public reasoning. So I end by expressing my hope that I expect the new Center for Global Justice will give us many examples of the fruitfulness of seeing research as the art of the possible and not as a shortcut. That is the theory underlying it and not as the art of imaginary perfection. Thank you.